I came with the idea of having Rodney show here in Victoria um, because I live in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, and I teach at Grenfell campus in the uh, visual arts program in Newfoundland. Rodney is from Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. Um, and two and a half years ago, Stephanie McKenzie and I, we organized a symposium on Emily Carr in Cornerbrook, and we invited Jan Ross, Carrie Mason, and uh, Marcia Crosby to Newfoundland to speak about Emily Carr. And when they were in Cornerbrook, we brought them around to different artist studios, and we, were, we did a studio visit with Rodney. And Jan saw his work and really loved it, and she graciously offered him an exhibition here at Car House. And so that's how it kind of came about. So it's, a, it's again, it's this kind of east-west connection where I travel back and forth between Cornerbrook and Victoria. And so, yeah, I sort of facilitated the, the, the process and with Jan. I mean, it's obviously Jan's the curator in residence here at Car House. But, um, yeah, I had that kind of connection, and I kind of was the uh, Newfoundland end of things, but then obviously have a connection here, and I've also been doing a lot of research into Emily Carr, so, so that's kind of how it came about, and um, it's been great. It's been great having Rodney here, and great that so many people came to the opening today. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about him and his practice? And sure. How establishes over there? For sure, yes. Yeah. So Rodney yeah. is a very well-known painter in Newfoundland, uh, specifically on the west coast in Cornerbrook, but really across Newfoundland. Uh, he's a self-employed, self-sustaining visual artist. He um, he has a very large circle of friends and fans. He's he's really. He's from the town that I'm from, or the city, Cornerbrook, which is a population of 20,000, so it's a small city. So everybody knows Rodney. Rodney oh. knows everybody. Oh. He, he's the kind of person that you see walking everywhere. And um, His work is, is really, he's really a treasure. You know, he's thought of as a real treasure in our community and um, in our province. He's, as you can tell from the exhibition, um, he makes these beautiful figurative paintings. I first met Rodney when I first went to Newfoundland in 2000, and I was teaching at Grenfell Campus in the Visual Arts program. Rodney was in fourth year at that time, and that's when I first met him, um, and I've known him over the years, um, and he, yeah, he's a prolific artist. He works slowly, very thoughtfully. His work is very allegorical. Um, it has a lot of layers to it. It's a slow burn. You can see a lot of influences that kind of come out of the work. It's got a, a, it's deeply rooted in Newfoundland and Labrador culture, but it's also very contemporary, which is what I really love about it. One of the things that I particularly like about Rodney's work, and some of the work in the show really exemplifies it, is the beautiful classical structure of the paintings. He pays acute attention to composition and color and form and light. And you'll notice that a couple of the um, main characteristics of his work are chiaroscuro, light and dark, and tenebrism, which is dramatic lighting um, and also rich colors, kind of these jewel-like colors that he creates using glazes and layers, layers of very rich colors. So sometimes it's actually hard to get a really good reproduction of his work because the work is very subtle in person. There's this luminosity that happens with the canvases, especially the yoga, um, the, the, the painting of the woman doing the very complex yoga position. That one I've tried to photograph, and it's just, you, you need to take a proper picture of it. In the flesh, it is really jewel-like. Um, 
Rodney, he, as I said, he works really slowly. You can see also in the work, there's a lot of um, references to East Coast artists. They're not blatant references, but for example, there's Christopher Pratt references in Venus Calling, in the painting Venus Calling with the woman on the bed with the cell phone. The window at the back is immediately recognizable as a Christopher Pratt reference to the horizon and the water. And that might be something that people from Newfoundland and Labrador would see immediately. And other people, it would kind of resonate on a slower level. So you might not think about it immediately, but I think it's one thing I really like about the work is, is the complexity of it. Um, there's also, uh, it also has that kind of really still kind of uncanny quality that, for example, an Alex Colville painting has where, you know, there's a narrative quality. There's, this, there's a story. It's not a simple story. There's a complexity to the stories or the stories that he's telling. So those are the things that I find really interesting about Rodney's work. It's kind of old Newfoundland culture, there's these cultural artifacts. Again, in Venus Calling, there's a, a metal bed that the, the woman is sitting on. And somebody, from, again, from the East Coast, and maybe from other places, would recognize that as a, as a bed that would be seen in a house, in an outport house in rural Newfoundland. So it's very, there's this kind of embedded culture and story in the works, but again, brought forward into the present and contemporary life. This show of Rodney Mercer's work at Emily Carr House in Victoria is very important in Rodney's career. This is the first time he has shown his work outside of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. In fact, this is only the second time that Rodney has been off the island of Newfoundland. And the first time, he only made it as far as Truro, New Nova Scotia. So for me, what was really important for me about being involved with the show and co-curating it, curating it with Jan Ross, was to basically expose this amazing artist to Western Canada. I mean, we live in a really big country and there's kind of a disconnect between the East Coast and the West Coast. So to have the artist here, to have his work here, to facilitate and foster that conversation between two really different cultures. We're all part of Canada, but culturally we're really different. And to uh, bring his work here and let people see it in the flesh and get to talk to Rodney has been an amazing experience, not just for me and for Jan, but for Rodney as well. It has completely opened up his world and he has just had the most amazing time in Victoria. He loves it. Of course he wants to move here. Um, lastly, I'll just say that I wanted to point out that Jan Ross was hugely important in making this exhibition happen. She's such a supportive person. She's such a lovely curator, a beautiful person. And her attention to detail is amazing. Uh, if you look around the room, she has curated, appointed really, the room to complement the artwork. And when I say com complement, I mean it in the word to complete. Not that the work's not finished, but the whole room works in a very holistic way to complement the work. Um, there's there's colors that she's picked up on objects. For example, over here, she has these beautiful yellow chrysanthemums and this gorgeous teal-colored vase that pull out some of the colors in Venus Calling. She, Rodney mentioned that he initially was thinking of putting a seashell on the windowsill in this painting. And Jan has placed these beautiful shells here to kind of draw out that idea from Rodney's work. So, I mean, what a thrill for Rodney to have his work 
shown in Emily Carr's first studio in the house that Emily Carr was born in, a Canadian icon. Um, it's been an amazing experience for everyone involved and we're just really happy that it all came to fruition. The show is a group of paintings that I had done specifically for this room. Um, at the time there were some themes that were kind of, some things in my headspace that I were thinking about and during the past year, the previous year, in, in different coffee shops, we went over here conversations where people are kind of connected these ideas. A lot of these were ideas about, you know, one's history and one's past. And um, these themes also uh, came up in some films I had been watching, some poetry I had been reading, and with reference to histories, but more about kind of like letting things go and not being defined so much by your history and not regretting it, but not you know ignoring it either. Um, and these are things that I think I believe that not only apply to the individual, but also as apply to a place, a province, you know, even a country. Um, and it's all for just evolving and and growing healthy. Um, so I was I was working these here. I I was uh, these ideas out. I received an invitation from Jan Ross and Emily Carr used to have a show in this room. And so, you know, these ideas, this space, it'll work together. So I prepared these, these paintings specifically for this space, um, even though they can work well on their own, so they are definitely inter interconnected. Can you tell us a little bit more about the paintings that we see here, like, for example, this one here? Yes, this painting here is a painting titled The Scribbler. Uh, the portrait is actually, the, the sitter for the painting was a, a good friend of mine, Douglas Goff. He's, he's a writer from Newfoundland and who I got to know over the past 10 years, lived in Cornerbrook. Uh, I got the idea for the Pacific painting itself from a reading um, that he gave at the Irving Layton's birthday party. Um, at the Irving Layton's birthday party there was a number of local writers who got together and he read from Irving Layton's work to celebrate his, his artistry. And afterwards, each writer would write some of their own works. Well, Doug was reading from his manuscript on uh, a now resettled town in Cornerbrook called Crow Gulch. Crow Gulch, Crow Gulch is just outside of Cornerbrook, and it was kind of a connection point between Cornerbrook and the town of Curling. Um, there's something about Doug's reading. When he's reading from his poetry, you know, I've known Doug for quite a while. I got a, a good sense of his you know, his emotions and things. But there was such a, a strong voice uh, coming from him when he was referring to Crow Gulch, particularly in his writings when he referenced Percy Jaynes, the Canadian writer from Newfoundland. Um, in his novel, House of Hate, Percy Jaynes referred to C Crow Gulch several times. And it wasn't very, particularly a, a, a positive view of the town. Having speaking to Doug after, afterwards, at, um, I grow to learn that Doug's family actually grows from there. And it's kind of resonated with some other readings and things that I've been kind of studying leisurely at the time on transgenerational trauma. So I got the idea that uh, the paint Doug, uh, the text on the piece is actually page 186 from Percy Jane's novel, House of Hate. So I here Doug is painting out there and Doug is like in a moment of thought. He's making a decision. Um, as well, and also, I've read it several times when the artists, kind of, you know, we we make attempts at, you know, trying to conquer space, you know. We do, I think sometimes we, we can do a, an honorable job of that. But time is one thing that will always ex kind of escape us. But having said, having said that, uh, when I painted this painting, the rest of the paintings from this, uh, for this show were done in my studio. But this painting was done in my house. And the house actually used to be owned by the writer Percy James, who wrote the novel uh, House of Hate, that I referenced earlier. And so it's kind of bringing, bringing text and bringing all you, know, you, you kind of you kind of go through the past, kind of using history as trying to be unromantic about it, but definitely acknowledging it at the same time. You know, I think that, you know history can be used as a vehicle for taking you places and taking you into the future and and identifying with things, and not just kind of, you know, looking backwards. This painting here was, is, is kind of mixed media of, uh, it's, 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 of printed um, text on canvas and, and applied uh, acrylic paint and alkyd on top of it, and it's, and it's executed as a diptych. Um, 
the idea of dress painting came from after watching what well, kind of there's a theme that I had running in my mind about taking about the province I'm from, Newfoundland. And some ideas that were at the time I was thinking about, I was thinking about, you know, some, some, some really strong mot motifs and icons in our, in our culture. And they're very, they're very important part of our history. Uh, and I think they could be, they can be used. I think sometimes they can be a little bit abused um, in, in so much to the point where they actually could lose their meaning. Um, and also, they can be defining, you know. Um, at the time, I was having these ideas and these thoughts about my, my place where I'm from, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. I watched a film, The Red Balloon, and as many, uh, as, as film made in post World War II, and there's many different interpretations of the movie, but the idea of uh, letting go of the past, and some people think it might have been a kind of reference, maybe Germany, you know, and you know, sometimes we have, a, you know, our, our histories can have a, a very strong weight to them, you know, and they can pass through generations and things, and it's a, it's a mindset that gets very ingrained in, in your decision making. So the text of ref reference to references some key parts in uh, the province's history, things like resettlement, the moratorium, uh, things like that, and you know, hold on to them, but learn from them. Don't let them define you. And let them set, you know, set examples, because these things will always be in our history. Things in our, you know, in our, you know, some of these in our political landscape, um, they will always happen. You know, it's up to you to decide how you feel about them, what do you do about them. But you know, don't let them make you less of a person, or the province less of a province. At the top, there's some more articles pertaining to the province's history. Um, there's a poster that was done. I think it was done in possibly the late 80s, and it gives us reference to the development of the Churchill. And this is a kind of a prelude to building up the, of the now um, ongoing Muskrat Falls project, the development in Churchill Falls. And, you know, it's, it doesn't, hasn't won favor amongst uh, many people on the island, in the province, and the people of Labrador, especially the Aboriginal. Um, so I surround that with some things in the recent memory a little bit of lightheartedness and a little bit of humor. Uh, refer it references the, when Premier Brian Pickford came up with the idea of the hydroponic project known as the Sprung Greenhouse. You know, it was kind of a, I don't think a, a well thought out plan. Um, and it's these things, you know, these things will always happen. So the piece is called Uplift It, you know, and it's kind of like, like this, the balloon is often used as a symbol in that work, um, just kind of a letting go and a, and a sense of freedom, you know. So, you know, carry it with you, but don't let it define you. And uh, as my, in my art practice as well, you know, you, you evolve. And sometimes you can kind of lean a bit towards your, your previous work. And that, amongst other things at the time, were, you know, some things I, work, uh, I was kind of, that I was trying to let go as well. Um, the model in the painting is, is a, it's one of my, a good friend of mine in the community, you know, and I'm a full-time working artist. Herself, Candace, she's a, she's a, she makes a living at dancing, of all things, at, in a town of 20,000 people. So uh, every now and then, I like to, I ask my friends to be in my paintings because they're cheap, <laughs> they're inexpensive. Uh, but also, it's, it's a nod. It's a little tradition that came out in the society. I think artists would often paint, you know, you get uh, this painter of this writer, or that, they're, they're, you know, they're, um, contemporaries at the time, but I think it, it uh, served as a, uh, a way of record keeping. And yes, we do live in the, in the modern age and things with digital media and things, but I think that sometimes a painting can uh, bring things to the viewer and things to uh, historians that are on a level that's a little bit different. And I like to keep that tradition going. So often I will use people such as Candace in my works. Uh, this is a painting uh, I did this year called Venus Calling. Um, you know, the, the Venus figure is probably said by art historians to be the, the oldest known artwork by, created by a human, is the, the Venus of Willendorf. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing theme, you know, the, the Venus figure. Um, in my m visual memory of the province I grew up in, there's, there are some artists that stand out. 
And you know, their artworks, you know, like in the school system, like some artworks were made for posters and you'd be sitting down you know, in your geography class and there'd be something on the wall and you knew it was there, but as you get older, oh, that was a Jerry Squires painting, or well, that was a Mary Pratt painting, or David Blackwood, or a Christopher Pratt. Um, an example of this would also be in the school system. You know, we often use uh, Newfoundland, writer, Newfoundland Labrador writers and, and textbooks. And there's a section of the book published by Breakwater Books. And the book was, uh, it was help, it was partly produced with the help of a uh, Newfoundland writer, Kevin Major. The book is called Dory Loads, and it's a book that my oldest brother had. And in that book, they decided to put a little, a little uh, a selection of Newfoundland visual art. And I heard learn afterwards, it just got in just in time, all the images that came in. Um, a couple of images have always resonated with me, and one was an artwork by Christopher Pratt called Young Girl Seashells. It was a Venus painting, and she's, she has an apron, and she's holding an apron up, and it's just seashells. I don't think you can actually see the seashells, but it's got Young Girl Seashells. And this artwork always kind of, it's something about the time, how it always has resonated with me. And I, accident, I stumbled upon it by accident when, in a, in a, when I was staying at residence in St. John's. I did a summer session at the Memorial University. I went to visit the, um, the old art gallery in Newfoundland Labrador at the uh, Providence Arts and Culture Center. And I turned around the corner and there I was face to face with this painting, you know. Uh, so it's work is like, man, and like, you know, it's, a, it's an artwork that's it's been, has such an effect on me that, you know, so many times people ask, what's your favorite piece of art? Or if you could own a piece of art, for me, it would be that painting. So this painting is, is um, definitely influenced by that, but it's not like, it's not trying to repaint. But more, more as, as thematically and conceptually, it's getting with, on the, the notion of so, things that are ongoing and constant, things that are, that are around much, much more than much longer bef before my existence, and things that will be around much longer than me, you know? And the other thing that you can really, like, as much put in the words, I had a, a conversation recently with a friend, and she was talking about some Aboriginal writings. You know, the stories don't have a beginning or end. They're ongoing and they evolve. You know, with time and time ev and time ev and time evolves the writings. Um, so it's kind of where my headspace was with this writing. You know, that conversation, I kind of actually realized more of this work is about. Having said that, now there's some there's some styling cues and there's some compositional devices put in this painting to kind of tie things together and kind of make you focus in on things, you know? Venus Colony, it's a, it's a, you know, it's kind of, it's definitely a modern painting, you know, the young, the sitter, she has a cell phone. And it's hard, I've found, to paint such things like phones and computers in their artwork, contemporary artworks, whatever looking kitchen. I say it's not impossible, and it's definitely done and done quite well. But for me, it was, thought it'd be a bit of a challenge, but I think, you know, the reaction has been, uh, well to the painting. Um, this artwork as well, it was a bit of a, a departure for me because a lot of the artwork was actually very composed, you know, um, the setting, the floor, the room, the windows, all these things were from my imagination. The, the sitter came from some thumbnail sketches and from um, probably about 50 different photographs and taking a pinch of the best, you know, the angles had changed, I've changed the angles and things. Um, scientifically, the work couldn't actually exist because uh, the, the, the vanishing point is from our heart and the center of the painting, when you, you kind of go into things, you go, oh, it's actually her womb, you know? And it's, uh, and the lines on the bed and these rails, our stuff are exaggerated, but it's kind of bring the viewer focus in, you know? You look at the painting and you go straight to the model and Venus calling, you know? And, some people have asked them, what is she calling? What is, what, what is the phone call about? Is she making a phone call? Is she texting or whatever? Well, that's, you know, something that's up to the individual. Into the individual. People are going to look at the work and they're going to get different inter interpretations. That's fine. You know, my relationship to the artwork is my relationship to it. You know, it's unique. You know, I look at a painting by any other artist. I can never have that relationship that the creator, you know, that artwork did. It's just, it's just one of those things, you know. Um, you know, and you know, again, psychoanalytically, you know, I think people can look back at this artwork and there, 
there is there are certain things you know like it's an old bed or whatever you know there's some there's some history there in the color green and these colors these are colors that were are from various points in my life in this style of bed you know but it's kind of adding like that layer of my my marks and my identity onto it you know and it's kind of more for me and the ocean horizon line that runs through true our heart as well and that's uh you know another direct uh, reference to pratt as well as the style beds these beds are quite often used in his in his paintings you know so i guess timelessness is what the work is one of the underlying themes in this work is